My name is Susan Allen. I'm a harpist. I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Music at the California Institute of the Arts. And I teach a number of things here, uh, including some theoretical studies in music, um, some critical thought about improvisation. Uh, we actually get into the quantum fields <laughs> about free improvisation. I teach the harp, I teach chamber music, and I also uh, counsel the students. I'm chair of the musical arts program here in the school, which is the program that allows for the most um, broad uh, approach to curricular uh, content that we offer. I grew up in Santa Barbara in a very um, privileged location and I thought harps were normal. They appeared in lots of buildings I went into. My mother was a, uh, a church choir conductor, organist, pianist, vocal coach. Uh, my father's a lawyer and um, we had a I went to the, was raised in the Unitarian Church, and there was a the organist was married to a harpist, and she'd bring her harp in every now and then, and he'd compose a new piece, and she'd play it. I think that's how I got to doing new music on the harp. <laughs> Who else would think of that one? So um, yes, and then I went through the traditional, you know, lines of study, private lessons, music academy of the West in the summers, and went to New England Conservatory of Music for my first year of college, and hated it because it was the, the harp teacher was a wonderful harpist. He'd been in the Boston Symphony for 54 years when he finally retired, but uh, he was old school, you know, French conservatory method, you know, almost with a stick. I couldn't do any experimental work, and I really, and that was also the year of Kent State, 69-70, right? So the schools were a wreck nationally, as you know. We, they all shut down. And I was just going to go apprentice with my teacher, my favorite harpist in San Francisco, Marcella DeCray, whose uh, specialty was new music, playing new pieces. And then CalArts opened and just appeared on the horizon. And so I, I transferred to CalArts in 1970 and graduated from here in 73. And then went out and made my way in the world on the East Coast. I played a commercial work. I played in restaurants. Um, I got to improvisation. Mel Powell always said I always improvise when I play these new pieces, he said, because people would write things that I couldn't play and I'd just make something up that would sound good for them. <laughs> but Because I, I always wanted to work with composers. So I did a lot of commercial work there and teaching. And then when I came back to the, to the West Coast in 1983, then I started uh, experimenting with improvisation. Started working with a group called Adam Rudolph's Moving Pictures. Um, he's an um, improviser, percussionist, does a lot of world music crossover work. Uh, went on tour with him and Youssef Latif. Uh, played harp with Youssef quite a bit. And then uh, moved up forward to work with Vinnie Golia, free improviser. And then moved forward to work with Susie Allen, free improviser. And now I'm pretty much gone off on a completely different tangent with that work. <laughs> now my interests are the large ensemble and that phenomenon. And I work with a, a trio that is um, uh, myself, uh, Russ Pearson, who's a bass player from the UK, and Nicholas Chase, who plays laptop and turntables. We do free improvisation for bass, laptop turntables, and harp. And I also play the Kayagum in that, which is a Korean zither, like a koto. I studied that for five years in Los Angeles. I'm interested in looking at um, how a large ensemble, or even a small ensemble of more than three or four people, maybe six, seven, up to 20, how that functions, how does that happen uh, without leader, without plan in free improvisation? And I believe it has something to do with self-organizing forms that are a proper a physics property. Um, I'm not sure about that yet, but I, I explore that in my work and in my teaching. I, um, and also uh, look at it not only from that perspective, but from other perspectives, from sociological perspectives, uh, interactive perspectives, group dynamics. Uh, that kind of thing, so that music almost becomes a metaphor for human interaction.
in the ensembles we do a lot of exercises that are designed to ease the flow of communication between multiple persons in the same room. Uh, things about deferring to others, uh, waiting to make your statement. Um, the self-organizing concept has to do with uh, one can put in what one plays, but the overall product, what comes out of the whole group, is something you can't control. So that's where it gets into the quantum world, where you can't, based on initial conditions, you can't figure out what the outcome is going to be. And I teach a class called uh, Music Improvisation Out of This World, in which I take a number of um, writings, philosophical writings, um, uh, writings in physics, uh, thoughts about suddenness, and um, thoughts about uh, presence, notions of presence, notions of self-expression, this kind of thing, even notions about uh, uh, spirituality. And we read a lot of stuff and talk about it, and we also play together. So that's the way I teach that particular uh, part of it. Because I was so astonished by what happens in the, in the improvisational group. When you let it go, it happens. I know that doesn't make any sense, but it does. And like when you let the endings happen, they happen. And I thought, that's a phenomenon. Is, can it be identified in some way? And so I started looking around for ways of identifying what was going on. But I'm not sure that, you, that one can actually identify it at all. The World Music Program is really important here. It sort of sets the ethos for what goes on as far as I'm concerned. Um, we have uh, Balinese and Javanese gamelons, both. Uh, we have North Indian music, and we have uh, Ghanaian music, Gave music and musicians who are great musicians from those countries teaching here. Um, students are required to at least make one foray into those fields while they're enroll enrolled at CalArts. And I've always thought they should be more than one, mm -hmm. <laughs> like almost full time, mm -hmm. because the, what you get from that is so rich um, in terms of, first of all, not being Eurocentric in the way that you view music, it's not just a keyboard. There's a lot more notes than that in the world. And also in the way that we look at um, pedagogical methods, the oral tradition, that's a completely different way than, than people teach Western music. And so to try to combine the two, I don't know. It's interesting to try to fiddle around with that a little bit. But I think that we were a, a, one of the first schools in the country to offer world music performance and that's why it's so unique here. To, you'll hear later in the day some drumming from far away, and there's some African drums down there. And it's just around here. It's brilliant. I learned how to count playing North Indian music. I and mean, for people who play that music, five against seven is like falling off a board, right? Where Western traditions never use that combination unless you're in some really gnarly Elliot Carter piece or something, you know. And I thought it was fascinating, you know, learning Sargam, the North Indian solfege, and that. So it's really very, very interesting approach to having a really broad notion of what music is on the planet, you know. And I think that a lot of times in our, in our pedagogy we get stuck on this Western notion, and it's not inclusive. It's actually kind of rude. <laughs> and imperialistic, you know. <laughs> so I'm very interested in, in having all these things be part of the educational experience. And I encourage my students to go to those places in a big way, not just once, but really get in there and play with it. I, I listen for things I've never heard before and try to be open to whatever comes in the door with that. Um, that impresses me if I haven't heard it. And it has some quality to it that indicates either a some type of skill, technique skill that's functional enough that we can work with that, or a potential for that kind of skill. Um, you know, in terms of like great phrasing, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. Somebody who's really, you know, can, can understand the music even if they don't have the chops to do it, yeah. Um, 
And I look for, a, I look, when in interviewing students, I look for people who uh, question what they do and who are um, eager to find new things to put in the mix, like the world music or whatever it may be, you know, some kind of critical thought. Um, in my program, we have all kinds of hybrid folks who do, do a number of different things, like a vocalist who wants to add North Indian and do some composition with her stuff. The notion of voice is, is really, really important. I, I like to encourage the intuitive side of music making. It's hard to do when you're using things like words to teach. Um, and I know, you know, there's always, in, in any educational setting, there's always this focus on, you know, skills and all these bases and stuff. But the, I'm fortunate because I get to fool around with the intuitive side and doing the improvisational work and things like that. And I think that that's, I encourage them because I enjoy what they do when they experiment. And I let them know that. You know, and it gets more and more out the further we go, <laughs> and they really are creative. I think in this country it's difficult. It's a difficult life, but it's rewarding. Um, and the rewards far outweigh the, the difficulties of it. And I would absolutely encourage them at any cost to go forward with it, if that's what they really feel like they should be doing. I don't discourage people from that. I had a parent who was afraid of me going into the arts. I've, I've said what I've always thought about that to parents, which is if somebody's really that convinced that that's what they should be doing, you should probably let them do it. You know, if there's, if there's a whole bunch of uncertainty, maybe that, that's real. But if a kid comes in and says, I want to do this, I wouldn't question it. I said that when I was 12. I want to play the harp. And I did, so we shouldn't doubt youth. <laughs> They're pretty wise. One of the great animation teachers here, Jules Engel, said it's not what we give to the students, it's what we don't take away from them, which is appropriate to that, to that inquiry. It takes guts and self-confidence and um, always, always inquiry, asking questions always an inquiring mind well there's different ways of expressing oneself and they're not all oral right some are visual some are experiential some are tactile um, and when you're looking at at all the, all the art forms you see this great you know this great way of being in the world a sensuous way of being in the world, where all the senses are engaged in expression. And I, I throw my students to the other schools. I have one kid, I remember, he said he wanted to take a theater course, and, I, and he came back over here and he said, you know what, they won't let me into the class because it's you know for theater majors only. I said, and I don't remember saying this to him, but he's in his 30s now and he remembers this verbatim. He's, I said to him, I said, go over there and don't come back until you're in that class. And he did. And he got in the class. And he got to do that exploration into the theatrical world that he had wanted to do. So it's interesting.